So we're in Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. And we'll be looking at verse 8 to 11 this morning. Before I go into that, I just wanted to say, um, when Dad was praying, when he prayed that prayer from Ephesians, from Paul, and, and Paul talked about the mighty power that's at work within us. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Christ at the hand, right hand of the Father, um, and that he has all authority, not only in the age to come, but in right now. And, you know, that struck me as he was praying that. It's a, you know, we, we talk about the kingdom of God and how it's to come. But, you know, the kingdom of God, Jesus said to the disciples, is within you. It's now. You know, if you're in Christ and he's in you, the, the kingdom's already come in your life. And he's in control of everything that's going on in this world. So that brings me peace. That brings me comfort. Even amidst all the chaos that we're constantly seeing uh, in our nation, in our world, uh, he has all authority right now. So. Just think on, I don't know, it made me think, so something to think about. But anyway, all right, that's the pre-sermon. Now we get to the real thing. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 8 to 11. Now, Paul in this letter, uh, he defended the biblical doctrine of justification by faith. And he argued the case much like a lawyer would in a courtroom, uh, presenting uh, evidence both from the Old Testament and from the Galatians' own salvation experience. As, you know, when they had believed the message that Paul had brought to them of Jesus Christ and him crucified for their sins, uh, they received the joy of God's grace and forgiveness through the gift of the Holy Spirit that God sent to indwell and apply to them uh, the salvation Christ had purchased for them on the cross. Um, and God gave them the status of sonship the moment they believed in Christ and adopted them as his own sons and daughters uh, with the full intention of making them his heirs. You know, these are all the glorious benefits of being a Christian, of being in Christ. And a glorious spiritual transition had taken place in their lives uh, the moment they believed in Christ. But due to the influence of the Judaizers, uh, who had come into the churches uh, emphasizing not faith in Christ, but the law and uh, Jewish legalism, telling the people that they also, in addition to believing in Jesus Christ, had to observe all the rituals and ceremonies under the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so the people had become confused, and they needed to be reminded again of their conversion experience and of all that God had delivered them from through Christ. And, you know, sometimes we need to go back and remember what God has done for us in Christ. You know, remember who you used to be, the life you used to live uh, before you knew Jesus. Um, that many times is really the pathway to recovery spiritually, to getting back on track. And this is what Paul does here. If you look at verse 8, we'll pick it up in verse 8. Paul said to them, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. Paul reminded them here of their former life. As many of the members in the churches of Galatia, they were Gentiles. And their lives prior to coming to Christ were dominated by idolatry and various uh, superstitions, pagan rituals that were attached to to the idols that they worshipped. As Paul said here at the end of verse 8, um, you serve those which by nature are not gods. Uh, they were serving man-made gods, uh, which of course are not gods. Let me quote to you, I like what John MacArthur said about this in his commentary. He gives a personal experience he had of, of watching idolatry play out before his eyes. He said, Several years ago, I visited a very large Buddhist shrine. Scores of men and women and even some children were bowing down to a giant stone image of Buddha. Uh, they were reciting prescribed prayers, uh, going through various incantations, and making offering of incense and food. He said, my heart broke because of their spiritual darkness and hopelessness. I wanted to shout, why are you doing all of this? Don't you know that, that that image is only a piece of stone carved by men? 
There is no God here. Buddha can't help you. He himself is long dead, physically and spiritually, and will eternally remain dead. There are many false gods men put their trust in, but none can save. And, you know, this was the state of the Galatians prior to their believing in Jesus Christ, serving and worshiping images of stone and, and false idols and, and living after false philosophies and so forth. Now, when I thought of that, you know, we have a tendency here in America to think, well, we don't do that, right? We don't bow down to images of stone and, and objects like that. But, you know, we here in America, we aren't any different um, from those serving idols and bowing down to images In fact, a lot of false gods and religions are among us and are even being embraced with open arms by our culture today, which is in itself a judgment from God upon us as a people for turning our backs upon him and his word in pursuit of the American dream and material prosperity. You know, this has been the idol that America has bound, bowed down to, excuse me, and served above all else, I would say, for years. You know, for years, um, the most important thing in, in Americans' minds today is the economy, right? It's all about the economy, and we hear it every election cycle. It's all about the economy. And as long as the economy is doing okay, who cares? That's been the attitude. Let the liberals do whatever they want, right? Let them have the schools. Let them have the universities. Let them have all of our public institutions. Just make sure the economy's strong. This is what's happened. And the liberals have taken over, haven't they? They've got control of just about every institution we have today. And they have spread the lie Of all roads lead to God, all religions are the same. Evolution, atheism, immorality, all of this has come into play in such a strong effect because we here in America have been worshiping wealth, status, success, personal pursuits and pleasure and achievements. These have been the idols of choice. We've been asleep at the wheel. And look what's happened. You know, the majority of men and women today in America are not serving the true and the living God. But they're serving gods like the Galatians were with things which by nature are not gods and thus things which cannot provide any lasting or eternal benefit to them. Things of the world don't satisfy, do they? You know, and that's one of the things that really brought me to Christ as a young man. I remember you know, going after all the things of the world in high school and wanting those things and hanging out with friends and, and engaging in the party lifestyle and all that. And But I, do, I still so vividly remember coming home every, each night from doing things like that and just feeling within my heart, what's it really all about? You know, it's truly empty. It truly brings no satisfaction. You know, Solomon had it right in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. You know, and if anyone could say that with authority, it was Solomon. <laughs> Read the book of Ecclesiastes sometime. He had everything this world could possibly ever provide to provide satisfaction sensually, to intellectually. You know, he was, Solomon was wise, right? He had wisdom above all men. God blessed him with wisdom. God blessed him with wealth. Uh, in fact, the he was so rich that he made silver as common as stones in the land of Israel. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, there's a lot of stones, there's a lot of rocks. But that's how common silver became under his reign. Perhaps there's no king in all of history who's ever been more wealthy and prosperous than Solomon. And yet, what does he say about life? It's empty. It's meaningless. Apart from God. This is where the Galatians were, serving these false gods. And I say this is where America is, you know. 
And people need to wake up to their need for God and for Christ. This is what we need to be praying for, for our neighbors and um, friends and those who around us who don't know Christ. Paul said, you didn't know God. That was your problem. But then verse 9, he went on and said, but now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Now the Gentile believers, in a sense, they were trading one form of bondage in paganism and idolatry, you know, with all of its superstitious beliefs and practices, from which they had been freed when they received Jesus, for another form of bondage in embracing now Judaism and seeking to conform to all the Old Testament rituals and ceremonies and laws, as these things also, um, Paul said, were weak, beggarly elements. We talked about that last week. Uh, They were like the spiritual ABCs, if you will. Uh, You know, the problem with the law is that it could not reveal God in all of his fullness. Nor could the law bring men and women into a right relationship with with God. It says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 19, that the law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. Again, it did not reveal God in all of his fullness, and nor could it provide purification from sin and give the worshiper a righteous standing before God and bring him or her into the holiest of all, into the presence of God. You know, under the law, a great gulf remained between God and the people. And all the prescribed worship and ritualism under the law, it was meant by God only to be temporary and preparatory. Uh, kind of like spiritual grammar school, if you will. It was meant to prepare the people for the time when God would send his son into the world. That was its purpose. And with the coming of Christ, God has been revealed. And the veil uh, surrounding God has been taken away. Listen to what John said in uh, John's gospel. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. John the apostle said, In the beginning was the word. He's talking about Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So the mystery of God here is really being unfolded in this one verse, John 1.1. 1, 1. We see that the word was in the beginning, so he was with God, but he also was God. What are we, what's being revealed here? The triune nature of God, the plurality of persons within the Godhead. And here we're being introduced to God the Son, the eternal word. And John went on to say, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then he went on to say in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 18 John said, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. God's been revealed in Christ. Jesus said, if you've seen me, the Tom, that's what I'm talking about here, you've seen the Father. He is the express image of his person, Hebrews chapter 1. That's the, the outshining of his glory. And listen, Christ as our great high priest has provided the sacrifice necessary to take away our sin and guilt before God through the offering of himself on the cross. Under the law, that never could happen. It's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Listen to Hebrews 9, verse 13 to 14. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. So the offerings under the Old Testament provided an outward covering. That's all it was. It didn't touch the heart. 
It didn't deal with the conscience. It couldn't take away sin. It couldn't give you boldness before God. You couldn't enter into the holiest of all. That was only one man one time a year, the great high priest, right? But it provided an outward type of cleansing, a covering, if you will, on behalf of the sinner. But it didn't take away the sin. And so comparing these things in Hebrews 9, 13 to 14, verse 13, he said, listen, if the blood of bulls and goats could make you clean in an external sense and grant you entrance into the temple, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, listen to this, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's a great verse. The blood of Christ, what it can do. It can take away your sin and bring you into a right relationship with God. You can go into the holiest of all, right into the presence of God. In fact, Hebrews 4, it says, come boldly through the throne of grace. Now, that wasn't available under the law. And thus, the logic here, Paul is saying, you're going back to the weak and the beggarly elements. How is it that you're turning from Christ to the Old Testament law and the Old Testament system of worship again? How is it that you're doing that? It's like you're walking away from the reality or the temporary. Um, for things that had to do only with carnal and outward observances, you know. People do it today, too, don't they? How many people don't know nothing of the reality of Christ, know nothing of the reality of forgiveness of sins, know nothing of the reality of the Holy Spirit, know nothing of the reality of the assurance of their salvation, but they continue to go to their ritual day by day, hoping that that's going to do something, you know, crossing themselves praying a certain prayer, religious jargon and things like that. The, the, the Galatians had experienced the reality of Christ, and they were going back to that. That's what Paul can't understand. They were walking, they had experienced the power of the gospel in their lives. And now they were heading back, backward. You know, whenever somebody begins to make much of ritual, I always get worried <clears throat> about them. Uh, because in Christ, you know, those things just aren't important anymore. It doesn't matter, um, you know, if your minister wears a robe when he preaches or doesn't. Uh, it doesn't matter if he's wearing a suit and a tie or if he's just wearing a collared shirt. Those things just have to do with outward appearances. And if, you know, if, if, you, if that's what you like, that's fine. If that's your, um, what you're comfortable with. But it's not what really matters. What matters is the heart. What matters is the reality of Jesus Christ in your life. Not going through certain forms of worship. How many people have fought for years in the church over forms of song? <laughs> well, we do hymns only. Well, we do praise choruses only. You know, going both, you know, just fighting over things that don't really matter, you know, in the end of the day. What matters is this. Do you know Christ? Is he being glorified in your life? Are you walking with him daily? Is the church bringing glory and honor to him? That's what matters. Um, how many churches have split over things like that? And it's sad. And so Paul here said, how is it that you're returning to the weak and to the beggarly elements? You know, you've come to know God <laughs> through Christ. If you've come to know God through Christ, you've been forgiven of all your sins. You've been elevated to the status of a son. You have all the rights and privileges of a son. So Paul, in bewilderment, asked that question in verse 9. Now, he went on, if you look at verse 10 and 11, he said, You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you 
lest I have labored for you in vain. Hmm. You know, they were turning back to the ritualistic observances of days and months and seasons and years under the law. Moses, uh, subjecting themselves to the Jewish religious calendar from which Christ had set them free. You know, there's only two ordinances in the church, two sacraments. Communion, right? The table, the body and the blood of the Lord that we observe monthly. Baptism. Those are the only two um, sacraments that we find in the New Testament. You know, when Christ came, he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled all of the Old Testament feasts and so forth. And so it was no longer necessary to celebrate the Passover um, and all the other annual feasts and holy days because, again, they were fulfilled in Christ. And listen, it was through Christ that they had been saved and reconciled to God, not through the law. So you're turning from the one who saved you to go to the one that condemned you. The law of Moses. He condemned you. And now it has glimpses of Christ in it. And it has, um, it prepares a person for Christ. But it's meant to usher you to Christ. You remember Paul said it was like a tutor or a schoolmaster. That you might come to Christ and be justified by faith. And so it was not necessary to go back to all that. And that's why Paul said, I'm afraid for you. Because they were turning from Christ to law. You know, with Jesus, it's a living relationship, isn't it, with God? Jesus described it in John 15 as he being the vine and we being the branch. In other words, he's the life source. The branch is only going to live so long as it's connected to the vine, Christ. Right? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So it's all about your knowledge of Christ, your walk with Christ, staying connected to Christ. Not going through ritual or being religious. Now, on the other hand, let me just say this. Does that mean that if someone of Jewish descent and background, if they wanted to still observe the Passover and um, some of the other feasts and customs under the law, after having believed in Christ, that that would be wrong for them to do? No, it would not. You know, Paul himself in the book of Acts, um, on one occasion, uh, took the Nazarite vow. Uh, and he did that to express his deep, his deep thanks to God for the encouragement that God had given him through a difficult, difficult time he went through when he was in Corinth. Paul was uh, afraid when he, was in, when he was in Corinth. And the Lord helped him through that time. In fact, the Lord appeared to him in a vision and said, don't be afraid, Paul, I have many people in this city. Um, and so Paul, out of gratitude, he actually uh, took the Nazarite vow. You know, he shaved his head and um, you know, abstained from wine and all the rest. Um, out of thankfulness to God. And so, was that wrong for Paul to do? No. No, Paul, as a Christian, he knew, of course, that all the efforts to save oneself under the law through ritual and tradition and legalism, they were worthless uh, compared to the true righteousness and knowledge of God that comes through knowing Christ. But that being said, Paul, naturally speaking, was still a Jew and thought, very much like a Jew and in terms of the Jewish faith. And so there was nothing wrong with, with him taking that vow. Um, and, you know, we have to understand, too, we're talking, Paul's talking a lot about the law in this book. But that didn't mean that he became anti-Jewish. Um, he was actually accused of that by many of the uh, believers in the Jerusalem church. And... In fact, when he went to Jerusalem, uh, he, James, who was the head of the church, asked him to take another Nazarite vow with four other Jewish men to pay their expenses to go to the temple and go through it all just so that the people would know, hey, he's not anti-Jewish. 
Um, Paul had no problem with other Jewish Christians celebrating their rich spiritual heritage as Jews, so long as their doing so did not in any way detract from Christ and the gospel. That's the point. Um, he, he was against that. And he did not want anyone to be deceived into thinking that observing the Jewish feasts and days and customs could make them righteous before God or superior to the Gentiles. Uh, this was the thing that Paul constantly fought against in the New Testament. Um, and that's important because these, you know, these, Ju these Judaizers are coming to the church telling the Gentiles, you got to get circumcised. You got to start, you got to basically become a Jew if you're going to become a true Christian or if you're going to be saved. That's Paul. That's what he's fighting against in this letter. It's none of those things save anybody. It's personal faith in Jesus Christ that saves a person. It's your being connected to Christ. And you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to observe any of these things. And, you know, this is something that I would say we also need to watch for. You know, now most of us, none of us are having issues, I'm sure, with um, someone telling us that today we need to become Jewish, right, if we're going to be saved. <laughs> I don't think that's an issue. We don't have any Judaizers in here today, do we? <laughs> but we too in Christendom, right, have our traditions and we have our religious calendar. And there are some who place great emphasis on days and months and seasons and years and so forth. But the thing we need to constantly be reminded of as believers in Jesus Christ is that every day is a holy day. Did you hear that? Every day in Christ is a holy day. In Christ, I worship God every day, not just on certain days or months or seasons or years. And this is important to point out because how many people have been deceived into thinking that they are Christians because they go to church on Christmas or Easter or they observe Lent, right? Or they don't eat meat on Fridays or whatever else. Listen, none of those things make a person a Christian or righteous before God. It's not through works, it's through faith. Personal faith in Jesus Christ is what justifies the sinner for God, nothing in my hands I bring, simply through thy cross I stand. That's, the, that's the, the mantra of the believer. And listen, if I've been justified before God in Christ, then that will be evident in my life, not by me observing rituals, not by me worshiping God on certain days, no, but rather by the personal devotion that I give to God daily in my heart. Not, to, not just on certain days, months, seasons, or years. This is the truth Paul was fighting to preserve in this letter. The reality of Christianity. The reality of the cross the reality of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on behalf of the believer and the reality that that brings into my life. No longer a slave, I'm a son. And as a son, I have all the rights and privileges of a son. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ and ultimately an heir of God the Father himself. These are glorious things. Why? Would I go back to the wheat and the beggary of all of that? Now, if you want to celebrate certain um, days and months and years and seasons, that's fine. You celebrate Christmas, right? Nothing wrong with it. But I'm also not commanded to do it in Scripture. But I think it's a great thing to celebrate. Who? Why wouldn't we celebrate the birth of Christ, right? I think that was one of the most... Um, that was the most, excuse me, important event in history. 
aside from the cross and the resurrection, uh, the incarnation of the Son of God. And celebrating Easter, I mean, of course, right? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. These are great things to celebrate. But it's not in celebrating those things that makes me saved. <laughs> it's my faith in Christ that saves me. I celebrate those things not to be saved, but because I am saved. And that's the difference. So, beware of legalism. That's the crux of this letter. And I think we'll stop there. Because if I keep going any further, we'll be here longer. And <laughs> you guys want to go eat lunch. So anyway, shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. Um, it's truly a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path, Lord. And God, just keep each of us right before you. Help us not to grow legalistic in any way, Lord. Um, just help us to remember who we are in Christ and never to pin ourselves down to rules and regulations that you, Lord, things that you haven't put on us. Help us not to put them on ourselves, and God, keep us from ever putting them on anybody else. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.